And thanks to the Austin Stone story team for putting that together. It really has been amazing. Well, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles. Thanks, Marshall. Open up your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 7. And we're going to continue through our text today. Um, we're going through the book of, of First Peter, verse by verse, and what we're going to see in the text today is that Peter's going to talk about some of the ways that you and I ought to live our lives and conduct ourselves in light of the second coming of Jesus. That's what this is about. And so in, in light of the fact that Christ is going to return, how we ought to live. And so let's read this together, First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He starts off his argument with an interesting phrase. He says, <clears throat> excuse me, the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. And we talked a little bit about that last week, but some of y'all were probably gone because of Thanksgiving, so I just wanna briefly go back over it. What does Peter mean when he says, that's kind of a crazy thing, the end of all things is at hand. Well, what he's talking about is this, is that from the beginning of time, God has had a plan of salvation for his people. And what he's saying is that the consummation or the end of this plan is upon us. In other words, from the very moments of creation in Genesis all the way through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and the law, and the prophets, and all the way through Jesus, and his birth, and his death on the cross, and his uh, resurrection, and the, his ascension into heaven, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the birth of the church, and the fulfilling of the Great Commission, all the way till through Revelation, and the sound of the trumpet, that is God's big, great plan and history of our salvation, and what Peter is saying to you and to me is that we are in the final stages of this great plan of salvation. And so that's what he means when he says the end of all things is at hand. Now look at uh, 1 Peter 4, 7 again. Watch what he says next. He says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore. And that's an important word. Okay, his point is this. It's like, look, we're in the end times. From the very beginning, God has had a plan. We're at the very end stages of this plan. And so, in light of the fact that Jesus could come back at any time, it was 2,000 years since those words were said, in light of the fact that Jesus could come back any time, there are certain ways that you, ought, you and I ought to be living that there's certain things that you and I ought to be doing, living our lives on a daily basis in light of the reality that the end is here, okay? Now, one of the things to think about is this, it's, it's a little bit of a problem for us because what I'm realizing is that the people that actually live out their lives on a daily basis in light of the second coming are oftentimes in our culture looked at as crazy. You know, if you, if you go down to Sixth Street and you see a guy holding up a sign that says, repent, um, because the end is near, we often look at that guy and think he's crazy. You know, there's a show on television called Doomsday Preppers, and these are people that think that, you know, hey, the world's coming to an end, so here's my response. I need to, I need to build a fallout shelter, and I need to hoard food and guns, right? Because the end of the world is at hand, and we look at those people, and we think they're crazy, or they're nuts, but here's what I want you to hear. What makes these people crazy is not that they believe that the end is at hand, because the scripture's clear, the end is at hand, and everything the Bible's ever predicted has come true up to this point. And so what makes these people crazy is not they believe, not that they believe that the end is at hand, but what makes them crazy is kind of how they're responding to the reality that the end is at hand. And what Peter's teaching you today and me is this, is that our response to the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back at any moment it's not to stand on the street corner and scream at people. It's not to, you know, go build a fallout shelter, but it's this. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, let's read it again. He says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore. And what we looked at last week, we're going to look at today, we'll look at the next couple weeks, is, is kind of this list of things that you and I ought to be doing every day in our lives in light of the fact that at any moment, Jesus Christ has come busting through the clouds and return. All right, now look at verse eight, because that's where we're gonna hang out today. It's what he says in light of the second coming. Let's do this. First Peter 4, 8. Peter says, above all, above all. In other words, what I'm about to say is the most important thing. This is the most important action, most important behavior, living our lives in light of the second coming. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. 
And so that's the section, second action he gives us. He says, hey, Jesus is coming back. Here's what I need you to do. Above all else, love one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, <clears throat> for us to really get our minds around this today, we're gonna kind of answer two questions. One is like, what does that mean? And what does that look like? When we leave today, what does it look like for us to love one another earnestly so that it covers a multitude of each other's sins? Now to really understand, I think, what the Bible's teaching today, what that means, what that looks like, you gotta get your mind around two words. The first is the word love. What does he mean when he says you love one another? And the other word is the word earnestly, and we'll look at that in a second. But let's look at the word love for a second. What does that mean to love somebody? Well, if you've been around church for a while, you, you've probably heard this talked about, but if you haven't, here's the thing you need to remember, that there are multiple words in the scripture that gets translated into the English as love, but they have all these different meanings. And so we get them all confused in, in our head. The first Greek word, or biblical word, that you see that gets translated into English as love is the Greek word phileo, phileo. And um, that's a word, when you see it in the Bible, it means to like something. It means that you have fond feelings for something. And so if I were to say the phrase, you know, I really love Christmas. I love Christmas. I love the food. I love the weather. I love the music. I love all the feelings I get when during the Christmas season. I love Christmas. If I were to go back and translate that phrase into the Greek, I would use the word phileo every time I said the word English word love, because it's a, it, it's a word that it means a feeling of warmth or likeness towards something else. <clears throat> now there's another word the Bible uses in the Greek that gets translated into the English word love and it's the Greek word eros. And that's a word that, um, that carries with it kind of a, uh, an erotic or sexually attracted, um, physically attracted kind of meaning. And the best way to understand what this eros kind of love looks like, um, you have to watch the show Bachelor, right? Or Bachelorette. That's the best way to get your brain around it. And um, how many of y'all raise your hand? How many of y'all watch the show Bachelor, Bachelorette? Okay, for the, for the five of you that raise your hand, I'm praying for you, right? And for the other thousand of you that didn't raise your hand or lying like a dog, I'm praying for you too. But here's the thing. <clears throat> what is like in the Bachelor, the Bachelorette, what's like the big moment in the show? It's like there's a moment in the show. And, and when this happens, when one of the contestants looks at the bachelor or the bachelorette and this comes out of your mouth, you're like, oh, that's when you know that the relationship has gone next level. What, what is it? It's when the person looks at the bachelor or the bachelorette and they say this. They say, I think I'm falling in love with you. And then when that person says that, it's like the, everything stops and everybody gasps. Oh. Because you know that if they say, I think I'm falling in love with you, then, then you know this thing has, at that point, it's gotten real. Okay, now what, what they're saying when they say that is this. What, what they mean by that is like, they're, they're saying, I'm at a point where I'm really, really physically attracted to you, and I'm having all these hormonally charged feelings for you, and the best way I know how to describe that is to say that I'm falling in love with you. Well, that, that word, as they're using it, really is best understood in this concept of eros, which is this kind of physically attracted, romantic, sexual kind of love. And, and by the way, have you ever wondered why the bachelor and the bachelorette, like they, they never stay together? Like, has that ever dawned on you? Well, number one reason is because that shows from Satan. That's the number one reason. And number two, it's because... That kind of like, that kind of love can never be the foundation of any relationship. Eros kind of love, it, trust me, it, it comes and it goes in every relationship. And so when you go down the road a little ways in a relationship, if that's what your relationship has been built on and founded on, and you wake up one day and you're like, I'm not feeling all these warm and fuzzy feelings anymore, and, and, and he's really not all that romantic anymore. And, 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 and then what, what do people say? They say, well, I must have fallen out of love with you, and then they jet. Here's, Eros is this, Eros love is great. There's nothing wrong with it, but it cannot be the foundation of any relationship. And here's the thing you need to hear. There's a third word for the word love in the Bible. And that's the word that Peter uses here. And he doesn't use the word phileo. He's not saying like or have warm and fuzzy feelings. He uses the word eros, which means romantic feelings. He uses the word agape. When he says love one another, it's used the word agape. Now hear this. The word agape is a word that means it's not, a, it's not an emotion, it's not a feeling, 
but it's an action. Agape love is never an emotion, it's never a feeling, it's always an action. And so when Peter says, hey, and is at hand, you need to be loving one another, <clears throat> what he's saying is that you need to display people the action of love, or, or, or we need, in other words, we need to be serving one another. We need to be caring for one another. We need to be forgiving one another. We need to be putting the needs and the desires of other people before our own. It's never feeling. It's never an emotion. It's always an action that you display. Listen, regardless of what you feel, regardless of what you feel. He's saying you show, you give this action of love whether you feel these warm, fuzzy feelings for them or not. Okay, so that's the first thing. Get your brain around what he's saying when he says love somebody else. Okay, now, the second word that he uses is really interesting. He uses the word earnestly. He uses the word earnestly. And what, he's, what he does there when he says, hey, love one another earnestly, is he's talking about the extent that you're supposed to love other people in your life or show this action of love. He could have easily just said, hey, the end of all things is at hand. Jesus is coming back, so go love one another. And that would have been radical, but he doesn't say that. He says, hey, the end of, of all things is at hand, therefore love one another earnestly. Now, what does he mean by that? The word earnest, the word earnest is the Greek word actinis, and it means this. It means to strain or to stretch something to the fullest capacity of your strength. It was a word that was used in, um, in Greek literature all the time, and when it was used in Greek literature, it was used to describe the muscles of a horse that was a racehorse. You ever seen a horse that's racing, you see that they're stretching and they're straining their muscles to the absolute full extent of their strength. And that's the word that Peter uses. It's a pretty radical word. Um, just example in my life, years ago I was on vacation and a buddy of mine that was my roommate in college was with me and we went snorkeling and we rented this boat. It was, it was just a little cheap rubber dinghy thing and we, we drove it out to this island, it was a small island off the coast, and just get your brain around how big this island was, about the size of our campus here, and we tied up to a buoy, and we began to swim around the backside of this island, we were gonna swim all the way around it <coughs> and snorkel, and about halfway around, or what we thought was halfway, the storm blew in, and it was a pretty significant storm. There was, there was rain, there was wind, pretty big, you know, uh, waves were coming up, probably five, six feet, and we had to make a decision. Do we, do we swim back the way that we came or do we keep going around and we guessed, trying to figure out which way was shorter and we guessed wrongly and we kept going. And I, so I'm swimming and I, I remember this pretty vividly, but I, was, I, would, I would have to swim up a wave and kind of rest on the way down. And then I would swim up the next wave and, and rest on the way down. And this went on for 35 minutes and we're not anywhere near the boat and I got to a point, I remember this, I, this was literally going through my brain. I, I went to a point, I was so physically exhausted. I was kind of just kind of reaching my fat boy days about that point. And so I was at a place where I literally thought to myself, I either keep swimming or I'm, I'm gonna die. Um, that, the, the, there was no beach, there was just rocks on this island so we couldn't stop and so I either kept going or I was gonna die. And so I just kept swimming and kept swimming and kept swimming. God, I had to dig down all the way into like fighting Texas Aggie Corps Cadet days kind of stuff and just keep on going. And then I finally made it back to the boat and this boat was just a cheap little thing. It didn't have a, it didn't have a ladder that you could climb up and you had to actually grab the side of the boat and pull yourself up and I couldn't do it. It took four or five times. I would grab the boat and just slide back down in the water. My buddy, who was a triathlete by the way, and he was having a blast, he got up into the boat and had to pull me in. And when I got in, true story, I just collapsed. I just collapsed in the boat and all the way back, I did not move and I don't think I moved for a couple of days. And that's, that's literally the meaning of the word. I'm not making that up. That's the meaning of the word that Peter uses here. He says, look, Jesus is coming back. We don't know how long we have. The trumpet could sound the end of all things could, could come at any moment. And so in light of that, don't just love people, but love people to that extent. Love people to that level. Love, love people to the fullest extent of your capacity. Now here's the problem. What I'm seeing, even among the people in the church, even among people that are Christians, is that we're willing to love people 
we're just not willing to love them earnestly. What I'm seeing, even in the church, is that we're willing to love people, not necessarily earnestly, but we'll love people conditionally. In other words, um, our, look, our love looks more like this. I, I will love you until you do something I don't like. I will love you until you don't meet my expectations, and then I'll stop. I will love you until you betray me, and then my love's gonna stop. I'll love you until you hurt me bad enough, and then I'll stop loving you. I'll love you until you start annoying me to the point I can't handle it anymore, like a roommate, and then my love's gonna stop for you. I will love you until this relationship we have becomes um, kind of unbeneficial to me, and then I'm going to stop loving you. I've just noticed that, even in the church, that whether it's our marriages, whether it's um, our friendships, our work relationships, whether it's our community groups, or small groups, our families, whether there's people of different political ideologies, whether there's people of different cultures, people of different races, if we're absolutely honest with one another, most of us kind of live our lives where our love has limits. We're willing to love people up to a point, and what the Bible is saying, so that's not how Christians live that we actually walk around on a daily basis with the reminder in the back of our heads and hearts, hey, this, this whole thing's almost over. And so in light of that, we're not just going to love people conditionally. The scripture's actually saying, hey, here's a calling on your life. You love people to the fullest possible extent that you're able to. It's pretty crazy. And I think that brings us to a question, okay, like, what does that look like? I kind of get this concept of loving somebody with action, but then he puts this crazy word earnestly on there that means to the extent of my my ability, and what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, he gets kind of specific in the next part of the verse. Let's look at it. He says, 1 Peter Peter 4, 8, he said, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, and then watch what he says in the last part here. He says, since love covers a multitude of sins. Keep loving one another with the action of love. You do it to the fullest extent of your power. Why? Because your love is gonna cover a multitude of sins. And so what he's saying is, look, there are gonna be times in your life where somebody's gonna sin against you. And not only are they gonna sin against you, but there's gonna be times in your life where they sin in multitude against you. And here's what this is gonna look like for you to love them. When they sin in multitude against you, then what you do is you cover their sin. Or you lay upon their sin the action of love. You, you, whenever you're sinned against, your response is to cover that sin with the action of love. And think about it this way, it's kind of the opposite of eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. It's like the literal opposite of that. The whole concept behind eye for an eye and tooth for tooth is in whatever way you hurt me, I'm gonna respond to you in the equivalent way with that same kind of hurt. But what the Bible is saying is that in whatever, as a Christian, as a believer, in whatever way that you've been harmed, you don't respond with the equivalent way of harm, but you respond with covering or laying upon that sin with the action of love towards other people. And you do it earnestly. <clears throat> right, somebody cuts you off in traffic You respond by covering that sin with love. And I have no idea what that looks like yet. I've been praying about it all week, right? um, Your boss treats you with disrespect, overlooks you for for a promotion, talks down to you, whatever. You, You respond with the action of love. You pray for your boss. You're kind to your boss. You show respect to your boss even when they don't deserve it. Someone writes you a really hurtful email. You respond with the action of love. You you ask for their forgiveness. You show them the kindness you wish you had been shown in your response. Your husband isn't meeting your needs. Your wife isn't meeting your needs. They're not acting in a way you, you thought they would. You cover their sin with the action of love. You, you serve them, you care for them. You, you meet their needs regardless of whether they're meeting yours. You cover their sin with, with love. Someone has a, different, has a different race than you, they disrespect you. Or someone of a different political affiliation with you, they, they do something crazy in your brain, which you, you don't respond in anger, hurt, resentment, or distance, you respond by covering that sin with love. 
You pray for them, you respect them, you show them the care and the love that you wish they had shown you, and you do it, the Bible says, to the maximum capacity that you have, right? Now listen, hey, here's, here's the question, I think. I was thinking about that, and I'm like, that's crazy. That's so crazy. And it's so difficult to do. And you think to yourself, like, who in the world actually does this? What kind of person actually is harmed or sinned against or hurt or disrespected or betrayed and then, and then just turns around and responds with love and covers them with love? Who does that? And the answer to the question is nobody in the world does that. Nobody in the world does that except the kind of people who have been shown that kind of love already. The only kind of person who can earnestly love another even though they've been sinned against is the kind of person who has already been loved earnestly even though they've sinned against somebody else. And so who is it? Who in this world, who among us, church, has been loved to the fullest level of desertion despite the multitude of our sins? Who among us has been loved that way? And the answer is, you have. And I have through the person of Jesus Christ. If you're a believer here today, you are already a recipient of that crazy kind of love. And that's how you can do it. Romans, listen to this, don't turn there. Almost done here, Romans 3.10. Paul writes and he says, it is written, none of us are righteous, no, not even one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All of us have turned aside. Together, all of us have become worthless. No one does good, no, not even one. And then he keeps going in Romans 3, 23, he says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scripture is absolutely clear that every single person in this room has sinned, listen, in multitude against God. We've all turned aside, we've all betrayed, we've all turned our back, we've all fallen short. And yet, how did he respond? How did God respond to your sin? How did God respond to you when you turned his back on him or hurt him or betrayed him? How did he respond to you? Did he respond with violence or anger or hurt or sin in return? The answer is no. In the midst of your sin, when you had sinned in multitude against your God, what God did is he came to this planet and he covered your sin with love. He covered it with the action of love. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave, it's an action, his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5.8, but God shows what? His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died. That's an action, it's agape for us. Ephesians 2, 3, among whom we all were once living in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and our mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God. It's two of the two best words in the whole Bible. You were in trouble is what that said, but God. You were dead, but God. You were going to hell when you died, but God. You had cast upon him a multitude of sins, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, that's an action, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Action. By grace you have been saved. How did God respond to your sin? He gave, he died, he saved, he made you alive. In other words, he covered your sin with his love. And that's why, by the way, Jesus said this in John 15, 12, Jesus said, this is my commandment to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Church, the answer to the question of how you're gonna do this is, is this. I mean, the only way, the only way that you'll be able to walk out of these doors today and actually respond to people who have hurt you with earnest love is when you remember that that's exactly how God loved you. That's exactly how God loved you. And then you'll know what to do. I've been a, a recipient of, of this kind of love through the Lord. And I've also been a recipient of this kind of love through my wife. You know, I've shared several times at this point that we went through a season in our marriage that was pretty difficult several years ago. We just weren't doing well, you know, and, and um, I'd sinned against her in multiple ways, um, and in the process really kind of hurt her deeply, and, and, and because of those sins and because of that hurt, the, the phileo and the eros kind of love really had kind of gone away. And I think, I think many women at that point would have done a couple of things. I think one, they would have just given up and left. Or I, I think the other response would have been this, would, have, would be to respond to my sin against her with sin of her own towards me. To seek revenge, to seek justice, to hurt me in the way that I had hurt her. And we talked about this a few days ago. She said that in, in, my, in her flesh, that's exactly what she wanted to do. The last part. But in the middle of all that, Jennifer said that she went to a Bible study that this woman was teaching. And guess what the scripture was that they studied that day in the Bible study? It was 1 Peter 4, 7. And the lady began to read the text. It said that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And above all, Keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And when she heard that verse, <coughs> just wrecked her out. And she started crying. And the Lord reminded her that she had sinned against him a multitude of times. And yet he covered her sin with his love. And as she read those words, she knew exactly what she needed to do. And by the way, man, a little side note, that's exactly why you marry a woman that's saved. That's why you marry a woman that has the Holy Spirit. Because when you're being an idiot, she'll listen to Jesus, and she'll stick with you when you're being an idiot. Let's a side note, I'll get back to my sermon. And so instead of, instead of leaving me or sinning against me or hurting me in return, she listened to the words of the scripture, keep on loving one another earnestly. Love covers sin. And that's what she began to do. She began to forgive me. She began to serve me. She began to care for me. She began to put my needs before hers. In other words, despite the fact that she had been hurt deeply by my sin, she covered my sin with the action of love. And here's what happened. In the process of me receiving that undeserved agape love, I began to change. And my response to me receiving this undeserved agape love is I began to love her in return. And as she loved me and as I loved her, as I covered her sin and she covered my sin, the hurt of the sin was still there but it's been, it was covered with love. And it just completely changed our marriage. Changed our marriage. And by the way, a little side note here, um, as we were showing and demonstrating that agape action style love to one another, the phileo and the eros returned. Right. So when you start getting this, when you start getting this concept of the power of love to change, and when you start actually like doing it, instead of responding to hurt like the world does, you actually walk out the doors and you're like, all right, Lord, give me the power, you've loved me, I'm gonna love people just like that, and you start doing it, and you start, you start seeing the power of love to change people's lives, and it starts changing stuff. It's changing your marriage, it's changing your friendships, it's changing your relationships, you see the power of then all of a sudden that verse 
that the only time you ever hear it is at a wedding, it starts making all the sense in the world. Y'all I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 13, everybody has their wedding, and at the end of it you're like, oh, that's very poetic. I have no idea what it means. Now you know. Love's an action, watch this. Almost done. 1 Corinthians 3, 4, 13, 4. Love is patient. And it's kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant. Is it rude? It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but, but it rejoices with the truth. Listen to the next part. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. It hopes all things. Love endures all things. And then love, last part, love never fails. The kind of love he's talking about is not a feeling. That kind of love will fail you. He's talking about agape. And it never will. It never will. My prayer for you this Christmas season is twofold. Number one is, is that as we, you know, as we sing all the Christmas songs and we go through all the motions of Christmas that you would not forget that on a cold starry night about 2,000 years ago, God left heaven and came to this earth and he put on our injured flesh and he would walk willingly to a cross where he was crucified so that the multitude of your sin would be covered forever and you would be made righteous in the sight of God. And if you've never done that, if you're here today and there's never been a time in your life where you've actually trusted in Jesus as your Lord and as the coverer of your sins, that today you do that. And the best way you know how, Lord, I wanna trust in you as my savior and the coverer of my sins because of the cross. And then for those of you in the room that have done that, that remembering that would cause you to worship. And lastly, I'm praying for you that if, if you're here and there's anybody in your life that for whatever reason your love has had a limit, that today you would remember the limitless love that God has shown to you and that you would begin to love those people again and that you would love them earnestly. Let's pray. Father, I'm 44 years old and I'm still blown away by the way that you love me. And I thank you for seasons like this where we get to remember your birth and we get to remember everything that you went through, that you left the the comfort and the glory and the perfection of heaven to come to this injured and messed up and wrecked out earth because you loved us. Lord, I thank you that you didn't have to. You could have destroyed us. You'd have been righteous in doing it, but you didn't. You covered our sin with your love. And that's why it's called the good news of the gospel. And I pray that if there's anybody here that's never trusted in the gospel, the good news of Jesus, I pray that today they would. And if Holy Spirit, if you have brought any people to mind in our lives to which we need to forgive and love and care for and serve and cover their sin with love, I pray that you would give us the power to do it today. Why? Because you loved us first. We love you, Jesus. We, we thank you for coming to us, and we look forward with great expectation for you coming again. And so it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together. Let's worship him.